Very close to twenty four. I think I think think you're right. But you for, can you see the queue with me? How did you get the room views up? I, I it just appeared. <laughs> it's not to say I did something intentional, but it just appeared. So should we? Hello, everybody. I was about to say good afternoon, but for people who are dialed in, that makes no logical sense. Um, welcome to the uh, Delay and Disruption Tolerant Networking Working Group Meeting, IETF 118. If you're in the wrong room, now is your chance to quietly creep out. Um, can somebody at the door just push the door shut, if that's okay? Just because there's a bit of noise in the corridor sometimes. There's a few more people just sliding in, so we'll give them a chance. Um, so first and foremost, this session is recorded, so uh, the mics are live. Please be a little bit wary about what you say, and we'll cover that in the note well. Next slide, please, Ed. So uh, as with all IETF meetings, this one is covered by the note well. I hope you are familiar with this by now, this being the second day of this IETF meeting. If you are unfamiliar, please make time to read this. There are copies all over the IETF website, as well as on the screen now and in the slides and materials for the chair's slides. Uh, the long and the short of it is, anything you say at the mic or contribute on the mailing list uh, is effectively in the public domain, and you uh, cannot come back later and claim that that was covered by some IPR, or you shouldn't have said that. If you said it, you've said it, so be careful. Um, we also have uh, anti-harassment guidelines, so uh, please contribute in a constructive and well-mannered manner. Uh, there are processes if you feel that that is not being, um, uh, if, that, if, if that is not happening, please bring it to the chairs, and there is also an ombuds team here to uh, support and adjudicate as uh, required. Next slide, please, if the clicker is working. No, the, the technology has died already. It's fine. Perhaps I should. Uh, there we go. So uh, th this is a new slide for for this session. The note really well, which uh, goes over the detail of the previous slide in a, in a little bit more length to to make sure that that uh, people do understand exactly what's going on. I think I've covered most of this already. Next slide, please. So uh, meeting tips. Uh, please make sure you are logged into either the on-site tool, the small little tool you can use on your phone quite happily or uh, if you're remote you will already have been logged in because we don't have blue sheets and it allows us to plan the right sized room for the next event and also to make sure you've actually paid to be here. Um, if you have any trouble uh, Meet Echo are around to support but uh, as of recently the, the client works well so uh, long may that continue. Uh, yes, if you are remote, please try and keep your audio muted when you're not actively speaking. Headphones, strongly recommended. Uh, it's always difficult with people dialed in from all over the world to try and get the audio quality high, but uh, the best we can do, um, if we can uh, try and achieve some good quality audio, then people can understand what is being said and uh, we can make more progress. Next slide, please. So... Um, these are some general resources for the IETF 118 meeting, including the agenda, uh, information on Meet Echo. So uh, the irony of this is being presented through Meet Echo, and here is the information of how to present it through Meet Echo, proving it's turtles all the way down. Um, next slide, please. So this is the agenda for this meeting. 
uh, there were some last minute updates where we uh, reorganized the open discussion, which we did have for 50 minutes because we're going to include two presentations as part of that discussion. So the bottom two items uh, above the open mic are two presentations as part of that wider discussion. Uh, the uh, top five items are actual presentations on working group documents or drafts in progress. So we'll start with those and then we'll get on to, to the later discussion. And, and I was just going to add to make sure that, uh, please, as we go, uh, particularly for those who are uh, online, make sure that you are joining the queue and make sure that uh, you join and help us uh, take notes uh, throughout the session uh, online. Thank you. So does anyone wish to bash the agenda at this point or should we move on? Let's move on. So, Sarah, I hope you're uh online and ed's going to get the deck ready and take it away when you're happy great can you all hear me yep wonderful all right um so hi everyone i'm sarah heiner i'm going to make this a quick update on the dtnma the dtn management architecture just to cover some of the changes that have been made since we finished the working group last call uh, next slide, please. So to give you at first a quick overview of where we are now, um, we've published version seven of the document that addressed some of the comments that we received back from the ops area, as well as the comments from the DTN working group last call. Um, all of these edits, we would say are very minor, um, mostly clarification of, of terminology, and then just making sure that what we are saying is consistent across the DTN network management ecosystem. Next slide. So in particular, we finished the removal of all of the management model, that's the ADM and operational data model details from the DTNMA. So this is in recognition of the fact that the DTNMA is an architecture document. So we wanted to adhere to that informational document scope. So we removed data type and object type details where they're addressed by the AMM and the ADM documents instead. Next slide. We also made some minor terminology updates to keep the discussion of core concepts consistent across those DTN network management documents. So this required just a couple updates to align the AMM, ADM, and AMP. So for instance, because the ADM makes a distinction between a control and a macro, we updated the reference model that I have pictured here to identify messages that are originating from the managing device as containing commanding data rather than control data, since that was only capturing a subset of that information because of the update to the ADM. Uh, next slide. We also received some really excellent review of the existing network management protocol discussion in the document from Brian Sipos. And we made his recommended changes, um, again, around the more careful use of terminology, uh, if you're sensing a theme here. So this clarified that the challenged network usability issues that were identified in this section um, for both SNMP and NetConf-like protocols did not stem from the SMI or Yang models themselves. So we distinguished between data model semantics model syntax, and the actual protocol used to manipulate data on an agent. So again, more careful use of terminology and making sure that we're calling out the um, similarities and differences in these protocols and um, getting into some of the nuance between data model, model syntax, and the actual protocol for data manipulation. Next slide. So finally, we updated the language in the um, use case section just to be more explicit in identifying the access control lists. Um, we identified them as items that are associated with policy expressions. 
but they aren't um, intended to be interpreted as required annotations in those policy expressions themselves. So because ACLs are internal to the DTNMA agents themselves, they're only represented in conjunction with the policy expressions in the examples here to help with the visualization of intent behind those use cases. Uh, not to say that they should be explicitly included in messaging or transmitted over the wire. So that is my last slide. So I'll just end with a thank you for the feedback and the support received uh, during working group last call. Um, and would be glad to hear any additional thoughts that the working group has. And, and just a, a reminder for that, the, the working group last call, I believe today is the uh, last day of that two or three week uh, last call. So if you have not had a chance to review the document, please do so today. Uh, and let us know if you have any questions or concerns or thoughts related to it. All right, uh, Sarah, thank you so much. Great, thank you. So next up, we've got Scott Burley uh, talking about bundle and bundle encapsulation and custody transfer. So there's actually two decks here. Scott, spend as much time on either deck as you want within the 30 minute slot. <laughs> okay. And, uh, 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 can you hear me? I, uh, I have a little trouble with configuration. Already. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear us? Yes, everything is fine. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I will. Um, I'll go ahead. Um, this first uh, uh, deck is actually uh, about five years old because there really hasn't been much change in uh, thinking on bundle and bundle encapsulation since uh, work that was done back in 2018. Uh, and uh, I'll I'll try to go through it quickly. This is I think um, mostly uh, in aid of getting uh, started on um, addressing bundle and bundle encapsulation in the context of the revised, uh, updated uh, charter for the working group. Uh, next slide. So, ah, okay, uh, quick overview of uh, what I'll be covering. Uh, I'll review the history of bundle and bundle encapsulation very briefly. Uh, talk about aggregate custody signaling because it bears on the, the uh, updated uh, BIBE design. Um, run through that design, uh, look at uh, some um, uh, potential applications for bundle and bundle encapsulation and, um, and some thoughts about the future. And next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, uh, BIBE really goes back to 2009. Um, there, there was um, work being done on uh, bundle and bundle encapsulation by uh, folks at uh, MITRE Corporation, Susan Symington, Bob Durst, Keith Scott. Uh, and at the time, uh, bundle and bundle encapsulation was conceived of as, a, as a, uh, a capability of the application agent of the BP node, and, and that is a, as a BP application uh, running on top of the, the, the real um, uh, BP. And the, the motivations were uh, uh, to uh, support uh, content-centric networking at some point, uh, to uh, support um, efficient custodial retransmission of multicast bundles, uh, and for uh, tunneling security. Uh, in, in particular, uh, traffic analysis is something that, um, because uh, BPSEC uh, can't um, encrypt the primary block of, of a bundle, because if it did, it would be unroutable. Uh, the only way to, um, to shield the um, the, the identity of the sender and receiver of, of a given bundle, the source and destination of a bundle, uh, is to uh, in, encapsulate the entire, is to encrypt the entire bundle and make it the payload or, or encapsulating bundle. So uh, BIBE is uh, ideal for that. Next slide. Um, th th that uh, original specification uh, was interesting. It wasn't really taken up uh, for implementation, uh, it sort of languished for a while and was resurrected in uh, 2013 
uh, as a, a, a um, as a convergence layer rather than as an application on top of BP. That is, the the, the new um, uh, BP would be underneath the existing uh, bundle protocol rather than above it. The motivation there was uh, to help in, in what we were trying to do at the time, disentangling routing from security. And the, the BIBE tunnel uh, took the place of the security source and security destination elements of the original uh, bundle security protocol. Next slide. Um, there was a, a lot of discussion of uh, custody transfer, meanwhile, in uh, 2015 and 2016. Um, the resolution of all that was that uh, it was determined that custody transfer with custodial retransmission really couldn't be made efficient. And I'll talk about that in, in the next uh, presentation a little bit more. Um, in some deployment scenarios, though, uh, if, if there were unidirectional links, the only way to uh, achieve a, a reliable transmission would be to have a, an asymmetric uh, acknowledgement mechanism uh, coming back uh, on, a, on a sort of uh, out of band or out of the same band as transmission link. And uh, how would you do that? Well, bundle protocol was an obvious choice for for making that happen. So uh, it, it seemed like a, a, a actually quite a good fit. Next slide. Um, so um, the idea here was that, that we determined that the custody transfer didn't really belong in bundle protocol itself, um, that instead BP transmission reliability should be accomplished between neighboring bundle protocol nodes, that is to say at the convergence layer. So um, the, this, this custody transfer asymmetric um, uh, reliability that, that we still needed, the place to do it would be at the convergence layer, that is use BP as a convergence layer protocol. And, and then of course, well, BIBE already did just that. It was being conceived as a convergence layer protocol. So uh, why not just uh, build this uh, residually required custody transfer capability into bundle bundle, bundle and bundle encapsulation and use it for both purposes independently or together. That is, you could use it for uh, cross-domain security, just as it was originally intended in 2013. Uh, you could also use it for reliable convergence layer transmission over asymmetric paths. And next slide. Um, at the same time, or so, sort of at the same time, in, in 2012, there were uh, guys at University of uh, Colorado Boulder had uh, who worked on a more bandwidth efficient definition of custody transfer because custody transfer turned out to be extremely useful for uh, operations uh, of uh, DTN over uh, links between Earth and the International Space Station. So uh, their, their aggregation uh, mechanism, aggregate custody signaling, uh, was documented in a draft that they never posted. Uh, we were indebted to Sebastian Kuzminski and Andrew Jenkins for that work. Um, the concept there was to uh, provide a, uh, an alternative administrative record and also an additional extension block in bundle protocol. And this mechanism was implemented as an option in the uh, ION implementation of uh, uh, BP. The idea being to enable custodial, custodial retransmission to be used for reliable BP on the uh, ISS where the uh, link data rates were uh, so uh, extremely asymmetrical as to be almost unidirectional. So um, the, the the fit was was deemed um, uh, reasonable in in that case. And in fact, the ISS guys loved the way uh, custodial retransmission was handled uh, uh, and and how it uh, provided reliability and operations. Next slide. Um, so. Um, uh, given that that great success, uh, in 2018, came out with a, a new bundle bundle encapsulation uh, specification uh, that included custody transfer and specifically this aggregate custody transfer and adaptation of the ACS that had been developed for um, BPv6. 
Uh, it uh, operates as an optionally reliable convergence layer protocol underneath uh, on the protocol. And the encapsulated protocol may be encrypted, may be signed. Uh, it neither depends on what you're trying to do with it. And the, uh, there, there are many um, um, possible uh, uses for this capability that I'll talk about in a second as I go through uh, some applications. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, um, uh, in, in this sense, BIBE um, takes the, the form of a reliable convergence layer protocol where the, um, the protocol is bundle protocol itself. The payload of the encapsulating bundle would be uh, uh, the encapsulated bundle together with uh, optionally a transmission ID and an expected time of acknowledgement, uh, both uh, provided if uh, uh, custody transfer uh, mechanism is is required on on this particular um, uh, convergence layer link. Um, the acknowledgement of the encapsulating bundle is aggregated into a new administrative record that is sent in a responding bundle. Um, there are uh, 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 custody transfer disposition codes in those responding bundles and and the, that responding bundle. Uh, aggregates the transmission IDs of the received bundles um, in uh, a format that's uh, pretty compressed so that it makes the, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, acknowledgement fairly low bandwidth consumption. If the acknowledgement is not received by the expected time, then the transmission of the encapsulated bundle is assumed to have failed and the encapsulated bundle is queued to be reforwarded. Next slide. So here are some possible applications for uh, BIBE um, that I think are um, uh, range from the fairly obvious to the um, exotic and probably Im improbable, but I think they're interesting to think about anyway. Uh, next slide. Here's the, the, the basic custodial reli reliability uh, model uh, where the uh, uh, the buy bundle is shown in green here, and it encapsulates the source bundle shown in sort of salmon color. Um, and the what's going on in between these uh, two nodes is that the uh, source node is encapsulated in, in a buy bundle and uh, forwarded to um, to the buy destination. The the buy destination in this case node two is the final destination of the buy bundle. Uh, but not the final destination of the source bundle. Um, uh, the uh, buy bundle receives the, uh, the encapsulating bundle and sends back um, using uh, a, a, an entirely different uh, um, uh, transmission path, uh, the uh, acknowledgement that uh, enables the sending bundle to forget about uh, resending the the uh, buy bundle um, at the at the uh, at the buy destination bundle, the source bundle is extracted from the encapsulating bundle and forwarded to the destination node uh, in the usual way. Uh, next slide. Oh, oh uh, I see a, a hand up. Is that right? Uh, yeah. It, in fact, my hand. Uh, so oh, yeah, your hand. Yes. So with, uh, with, with Chair Hadoff, uh, two questions. Uh, one is, is it always the case in BIBE that there is a single encapsulated bundle? Uh, or in these cases, would you assume that a BPA would put multiple bundles uh, into a BIBE? Uh, good question. Uh, in what has been written so far, it's always assumed that there's just a single bundle inside the encapsulating bundle. Uh, we could uh, talk about mechanisms for aggregating multiple bundles into uh, into the, the encapsulating bundle, and that might be a, a, a very reasonable way to proceed. It hasn't been documented yet. The the, the second question, uh, and and that makes perfect sense. The, the second question I had was, the uh, is there uh, in the BIBE um, uh, now a relationship between the extension blocks that are in the encapsulated bundle? And extension blocks that would be placed in the encapsulating bundle. Uh, there, um, there is no uh, mandatory 
um, relationship. Um, the intent is that the encapsulating bundle is a brand new bundle that can be um, uh, configured and directed in whatever way makes sense at the uh, at the at, at its source. Um, th that might in, might very well entail uh, borrowing some of the configuration from the uh, uh, the encapsulated bundle, but it's not required to. And uh, I think that's actually um, that distinction is is quite important because some of the things that you can do with Bibe would be um, limited and, uh, uh, and and maybe disabled uh, if, if you're required to um, uh, carry forward all of the quality of service and, and so forth that uh, characterize the encapsulated bundle. Oh, I completely agree. Uh, I was thinking more bundle age block or previous node blocks and, and whether uh, they had yeah, to be explicitly um, addressed. Yeah, and and um, you you uh, an argument could be made for um, adopting um, and, and carrying forward some of those, um, but um, I, I think it's a more powerful mechanism uh, if that is left up to um, implementation and configuration rather than built into the standard. Sure, thank you. Hi, Scott. Um, yes. Rick, yeah. Rick, joining the queue here. Um, again, chair mm -hmm. hat off. So personal opinion. My question really is about: um, Do you see the encapsulating and decapsulating pair of of nodes having the same implementation, or do do you foresee bundle and bundle encapsulation being a specification to allow two different implementations? to interoperate because I think that determines the level of rigor that has to go into the specification. Oh, I, I, uh, I would fully expect uh, the, the uh, sending and the, the, the encapsulating bundles source and destination to be um, um, uh, accomplished by potentially different implementations. I would expect VIBE uh, to be a, a, um, a defined uh, a protocol specification and and standardized uh, in the same way as as any other convergence layer protocol. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that said, uh, to my knowledge, there are no other implementations of uh, BIB at this time. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's it's quite easy to to change the spec now because you only have to change one implementation to conform. Um, next slide, please. And, and we just have one more person in. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric. Here. Yes. Uh, just a clarif clarification question: the circles uh, 62 and 19 are they just uh, representing topologies of of other nodes that forward the the custody signal backwards? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea is that um, there, there might be uh, any number of, 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 um, of bundle protocol nodes between uh, the, the source and destination nodes, um, but their operations are, um, um, are, are at, at a level below the operation of the transmission of the encapsulating bundle. Thank you. Um, uh, Cross-domain security is another um, um, straightforward uh, sort of uh, uh, application of, of, of this mechanism. Uh, you, um, you may have a, a couple of safe regions of the network and one that is extremely unsafe. So it may be that for performance uh, reasons, you, uh, your, your source bundle has very light security, or, or, uh, or, or maybe no security, or hardly any security at all. You, 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 you don't need to protect it uh, very strongly, but as it transits uh, a, a, a wild and woolly uh, area of the network, uh, you want to uh, add much more uh, uh, security, much, much more strongly computed uh, um, encapsulation and uh, encryption, for example. And so uh, you can use a bundle and bundle encapsulation to do that. The original lightly secured uh, uh, bundle 
is encapsulated inside uh, the, a bundle that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that is encapsulated that is encrypted in uh, uh, some um, highly you know post quantum kind of uh, mechanism to uh, ensure its safety as it as it transits the dangerous part of the network and then once it reaches the safe harbor on the other side the source bundle can be extracted and, and forwarded uh, in, in another you know benign environment um, uh, next slide please uh, uh, very similar uh, defense against traffic analysis um, you if you as I mentioned earlier if you have a, a source bundle and you really want the source bundle uh, not to be uh, uh, its its source and destination not to be advertised to the world. You can in, at the at the edge of a, an unsafe uh, region of the network. You can simply encrypt the entire bundle and use that encrypted uh, source bundle as the payload of a, um, a BIBE bundle, and then decrypt it at the BIBE destination and and forward it in the usual way. Next slide. Um, uh, going a little bit further afield, you can sort of, sort of generalize this idea, I guess, in, in, and, and say that you might uh, change the quality of service of a bundle as it, uh, as it uh, passes through the network. So uh, when the, the bundle is uh, in, a, in its local, um, uh, local region of the network, it's, um, say, assuming that we have things that are similar to the BPV6 uh, quality of service, maybe it's, it's expedited in, and it's very important. But once it gets onto the trunk line, it's just like anything else. So, so it's, now it's just standard. It has to just like you know, get, stand in line with everybody else. And then when it gets to the to the vibe uh, destination, well, now it's expedited again. It's it, it's very important. Um, you can imagine uh, other um, dimensions of quality of service uh, being adjusted in, 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 over the the vibe connection as well. Next slide. Uh, in, in particular, uh, there's a, a mechanism in ION, I'm not sure that it's in anywhere else, uh, called critical uh, forwarding, which is um, uh, the um, uh, determination that a, a bundle is so important that if there are multiple ways for it to get to the destination, you want to send it on all of them. Well, uh, that, that kind of determination might um, apply only in a particularly unstable portion of the network. And so rather than um, sending it from its source over every possible destination, over every possible path to the final destination, you do it only over the particularly unstable part of the network and the destination of the, uh, the, of the critical transmission is another uh, BIBE node, which simply extracts the, the bundle from which, whichever um, of, of its uh, copies it sees first and forwards it to the final destination node. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, transient multicast. You can um, imagine perhaps uh, an extremely unstable part of the network where um, you, uh, you, you want to um, use multicast to make sure that the bundle gets uh, to its final destination, um, but only certain uh, uh, subscribed nodes are uh, are acceptable egress nodes from that part of the network, and so they uh, they join the multicast group, and the uh, uh, vibe source multicasts to that group, and all the members of that group receiving copies of it of the of the uh, encapsulating bundle extract the source bundle and forward it to the destination node. Uh, next slide. Um, source path routing. In the event that you want to use source path routing, uh, here's a, a, a way to do it. Uh, you just encapsulate and encapsulate and encapsulate, nesting them as deeply as you need to, to, uh, uh, to ensure that the, uh, the bundle follows a specific uh, path through the network um, and, 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 if, uh, it, and doesn't go through any alternative paths, even if such paths exist. Uh, if you want to do that, of course, you want to be sure to secure the, uh, well, every every forwarding node needs to be secured against uh, 
uh, the arrival of the encapsulated bundle. Um, but if this is a useful mechanism, this is a way to achieve it. Uh, Rick, yes. Um, just a passing comment. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a lot of work around performing similar uh, capabilities at the IP layer that I think it's probably worth reading as we start to go further into this uh, sort of path protection functions is what they call it within the DetNet area, deterministic networking. So they're doing uh, packet replication, elimination, and ordering functions. They've got a very strong framework which covers pretty much your previous four slides. Uh -huh. There are there are frameworks well thought out, well peer reviewed that I, I strongly recommend that this working group looks at that work and says, how applicable are some of these techniques? What are, what have they worked at? What have they found doesn't work well? So a bit yeah, of cross-pollination there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what I would suggest here is that, that uh, standardizing BIBE itself uh, is, is, is an activity and standardizing uh, these applications, I think that that merits its own. Uh, each of these, I suppose, merits its own um, RFC, uh, and I, and ought to be informed in exactly the way you say. I, I completely agree because I think that was what the Debt Networking Group have discovered is that this is a very complex and uh, field, and by creating the building blocks and mm -hmm. then applying. Uh, explicit techniques for all of these things has worked well for them. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I won't uh, claim that any of these applications I'm talking about here are, are things that nobody's ever thought of before. What, what I would claim is that BIBE is, is a way uh, to accomplish uh, these things in a, in a delay tolerant uh, manner that I think is worth exploring. Um, so I, I think I'm almost at the end here. Next slide. Uh, oh yeah, combinations of these things. Uh, so certified multicast, uh, you, and the, the I think the idea being here that that uh, um, um, any of the mechanisms uh, discussed earlier, and probably lots more that I haven't thought of yet, are are enabled by um, this this uh, uh, mechanism that. Uh, uses bundle protocol uh, at the convergence layer, uh, enabling, uh, in a sense, enabling the uh, characteristics of the source bundle to be overridden in um, whatever way seems uh, useful uh, in the configuration of the network. And that may be my last slide. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, it, the, uh, I mentioned here that it's uh, being considered for adoption by the uh, DTN working groups in the charter. Um, it's not a uh, complicated specification, and um, I think it's quite powerful. And I th think that is the last slide. I think the last one just says questions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll just jump in. Well, actually, with chair hat on, um, this uh, spec, I believe, has been adopted uh, by the DTM working group. There, there is a uh, there's a non personal draft uh, for that BBCT, and I wanted to remind uh, the working group at large that one of the reasons uh, that we are having this presentation in this working group meeting is that getting bundle and bundle encapsulation standardized is one of our charter items. Uh, and and now that as we are getting through some of our prior work um, on, as as Rick's going to talk about in. Uh, after Scott's second presentation around IP and URI schemes and uh, the network management stuff, getting Bibby uh, finished is is sort of the next thing on deck. So uh, please pay attention to uh, the slides that are here, but also uh, there is a adopted draft to look at. And um, uh, certainly I'm uh, eager to hear uh, comments on the draft and, and come up with uh, 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 revisions to the draft. Uh, I think I'm uh, probably running short on time, so um, I'm, I will try to zip through this deck very quickly, uh, and um, a lot of it is, is old news anyway, I think. Um, this is sort of general ideas on custody transfer, on uh, why, uh, re sort of revisiting why it is uh, removed from EPB7, and um, 
and, and what to do about it in the future a little bit. Uh, it's a fairly short uh, deck. So next slide. Uh, this is actually, I think, the, maybe the most important in, in this presentation, which is that the concept of custody transfer is uh, not really um, a retransmission mechanism. It is, um, I think, a, a way to think about it is that it's an exception or a, um, an adaptation, anyway, of the end-to-end -end principle. That is, to improve performance, the forwarding nodes along the path from the source to the destination uh, are, are successively responsible for retransmission uh, rather than only the source being responsible for retransmission. That improves performance in, uh, in uh, paths where um, one of the uh, hops between uh, adjacent nodes is extremely um, long signal propagation delay. Uh, you don't want to pay for that a second time if it gets lost on, on the next hop over, over a trivial delay. So the, the, the responsibility for accomplishing retransmission is handed forward, um, and that's what custody transfer uh, is, and, and, and what the custody transfer mechanism that was built into BPV6 was designed to implement. Uh, next slide. Um, the, uh, the problem with using custody transfer to provide reliability uh, in, in and of itself, that is to, to accomplish the reliability rather than just to, to drive it, uh, is that there are no negative acknowledgments. Uh, the, the closest thing to a negative acknowledgement is I, I received this, but I don't want it. I'm not going to forward it. It's really uh, a routing signaling mechanism rather than a, than a reliability mechanism. Uh, absent uh, a negative acknowledgement, the only way to signal retransmission is to have a timer expire. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you do uh, retransmit, you have to retransmit the entire thing because you have no um, uh, negative acknowledgements, so you don't have any partial negative acknowledgements because there aren't any negative acknowledgements at all. So anything that is lost has to be retransmitted in its entirety. Um, next slide. Oh, Eric, yes. I was just going to observe that I think it's not um, the countdown timer isn't the only way uh, to know that you might need to retransmit. Depending on your convergence layer, you might be able to observe a convergence layer failure, uh, like a TCP timeout or something. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm I think I'm getting to that in a second. Uh, um, the um, uh, uh, you're you're right. Um, the uh, you know absent the signaling from the convergence layer, the only thing you've got is, um, is, is a timeout. Um, the the uh, custody transfer protocol itself d doesn't give you any clues. The convergence layer has to do it. Yeah, exactly right. Um, OK, so next slide. Um, uh, the problem with timeout-driven retransmission, uh, there's no general algorithm for knowing how to compute the the retransmission uh, timeout interval because uh, it's different in different parts of the network. Uh, next slide. Um, even if you had something that worked, even if you had ways of, of, of doing it properly at all points in the network, it doesn't do you any good because as written in uh, BPV6, nodes are never required to accept custody. So it, it's not between topologically adjacent nodes necessarily. So the custody acceptance signal might come from a node that's three hops away or 13 hops away. Uh, and of course, the custodian doesn't know that the bundle is going to reach that node because it doesn't know the path that the bundle is going to take end to end. So it can't know when that's going to happen. So uh, it can't compute the length of time that it'll take for the bundle to reach that point and come back. And and, and if it does retransmit, of course, it's always going to be uh, excessive because there's no partial retransmission. So the, no matter what interval you, you pick, either the, the timer will expire too early, and in that case, you're wasting bandwidth and retransmitting stuff that's already arrived, or it expires too late. In that case, you're wasting storage and you're retarding delivery. Next slide. Um, worse than that, and this is something that came up in in discussion like later on, uh, uh, bundles can be fragmented. Well, the if a bundle is, if custody is taken of a, of a bundle, 
and the bundle is then fragmented by uh, a node that does not take custody, then, uh, then the original bundle uh, it doesn't get received until it, uh, it arrives at its final destination. There's, uh, and, and, the, uh, and subsequent uh, custodians, subsequent nodes may take custody of the fragments and the custody signals of those fragments will not go back to the original custodian. Um, next slide. Um, multicast, you have multiple copies. The, uh, 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 the custody signals from the different recipients of the bundle, if it's held custodially, uh, can't be matched up uh, because uh, the custodians, the, 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 uh, uh, the actual recipients of the bundle may not be uh, neighbors of the source node, so it doesn't know who they are. So it has no idea of knowing wh whether all the uh, uh, members of the um, of the uh, uh, multicast group have received copies, and so it has no idea how to retransmit to them. Next slide. This is talking more about the same. Um, uh, be, the responding node doesn't have to be any of the nodes to which the custodian transmitted the copy because nobody's retired, required to accept or refuse custody. Next slide. Uh, so when the custodial retransmission expires, the custodian doesn't know whether it has to retransmit or not because uh, it doesn't know which child nodes received the bundle. Uh, it might have received uh, custody signals uh, from more nodes than it that it, uh, uh, know, that it knows about, and it doesn't know which ones it did not receive. There's no way to uh, match up the uh, custody signaling with the actual requirements for custodial retransmission. So next slide. Uh, I, th I think what we arrived at for BPV7 is that the alternative is just not to do this, but instead to uh, rely on uh, reliable convergence layer protocols. Uh, bundles, um, in, in the case of multicast, bundles are sent to each child node uh, in, the, in the tree using uh, reliable convergence layer protocols where possible. And, and where it's possible, this gives you reliable multicast. Um, and the, the general principle here is that convergence layer reliability is the way to implement the concept of custody transfer. Next slide. Um, this is the last one in this deck. Um, there is uh, an exception to all this, and, and this is this is, goes to what Eric was saying before. Um, when convergence layer transmission simply fails, the bundle uh, either has to be retransmitted on on the same convergence layer. Um, uh, in, in ion, it's called an outduct, so uh, the same convergence layer channel, um, or else the uh, bundle protocol agent has to determine that it that that route is the wrong way for it to go. And so the bundle needs to be sent back upstream to some other uh, branch point in the um, in the network to go on an, on an alternate route. So when it does that, of course, it has to forward the entire bundle for that purpose back to this other node. So it, it, once again, you uh, you pay the cost of forwarding the entire bundle sort of unnecessarily. It would be nice not to have to do that. Uh, an alternative would be for the upstream forwarders, um, one or two or three or however many generations back to retain copies of the bundles in case that reforwarding is necessary. In that case, then when custody uh, uh, converse layer transmission fails, you just send a uh, a, a uh, oops, failed kind of uh, message back to one of these custodians. You don't have to send the entire bundle. And that custodian then can uh, re-forward, possibly in a different route, the, its saved copy of that bundle. And uh, I would just point out that uh, a mechanism called, uh, um, well, a mechanism for, for status report aggregation is uh, being discussed in the CCSDS uh, detent working group that would uh, do this. And that seems to be a, a, a promising development that kind of resembles the original custody transfer idea, 
but uh, is uh, more powerful and uh, I think more useful. And that's the end of my presentation. I can stop now. So I just like to say, Scott, thank you so much for that. We we get frequently questions about the concept of custody transfer and what happened between bundle protocol version six and seven. And uh, I think this deck does a, a pretty good idea of explaining some of the thought behind it. Additionally, uh, the uh, this working group decided not to try and do additional standardization around custody uh, transfer because uh, other working groups uh, like the CCSDS working group are working on a signaling uh, that, that may do the same thing. So it, it, it also is a, a good opportunity to show where uh, we can let the communities most directly needing this feature uh, pursue it, and then we can understand ourselves whether we wrap it or profile it. Exactly. Thank you so much. Okay. It is you. Okay. So this is going to be very quick. Um, next slide, please. So the updates on the IPN URI schema draft are very, very small, uh, but quite critical. The intention being to make progress on this draft because we have become stuck on issues around governance, around uh, how IANA should hand out some of these critical top level items, uh, the allocator identifier in uh, particular. So we have made a change to the document and the only change that has been made in this document is to cull a lot of text from the advice to designated experts regarding the IANA allocator identifier registry. We have stripped it back to the technical considerations that designated experts should make. So that is in particular some CBOR value, uh, because of the nature of CBOR encoding, smaller integers are more efficient than larger integers. That is a, that is a consideration that must be made when allocating these numbers. Smaller, less on the wire, uh, more attractive. That is a technical consideration. What we have removed is all the language concerning governance policy, fair use access, uh, how IANA should behave or hand out numbers, because that is a far bigger topic than a technical specification, which fundamentally adds another integer to a, uh, a tuple of integers. So uh, that's the summary on this slide. Next slide, please. So the Governance policy text about this. So there's general consensus in the working group that fair access to deep space for all delivered in a transparent manner is a public good. That I don't believe is a contentious statement. And I believe the, uh, the discussion on the text, uh, discussion on the mailing list was very much around these concepts. As an author of this document, my pushback is the IPN update document is a technical document. It is a very dry technical document about adding another integer. Having a subsection in a technical document which suddenly starts talking about governance policy for deep space is bad editorial practice. If, we, if the working group or the community at large considers that such a document needs to, uh, that text about governance needs to exist, it should be in its own document where it can be properly reviewed and expanded and chewed over and uh, 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 treated appropriately rather than hiding it, accidentally hiding it, within a very technical specification document. So the suggestion as an author is, if working group members wish to write up a governance policy document, the chairs, and that's me with my chair hat on, the AD, the IESG, and the IETF and the Internet Society as a whole, will do our best to find the right place for it, provide it sufficient time to be chewed over, to be worked on as appropriate. But this document isn't the right place for it. So we've taken it out of here. The text still exists. There's a revision history. Um, next slide, please. That's it. We want to get the IPN document out of working group last call and published. There are people want to implement this. We can't keep holding it on the policy section. Is there anyone in the queue? Have I, have I kicked a hornet's nest? No, uh, no, not at all. Uh, and 
and that was gonna be uh, my point back, which is with this update, we would like to put this into uh, what we believe will be the final uh, working group last call. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, given that uh, optimism, uh, are there any questions or concerns or comments about uh, what Rick has presented here? All right. Good. Right. Okay. We'll go. <laughs> uh, next up, we will hear from uh, Sarah Heiner again uh, on zero config bundle edge node. Great. So, hi again. Um, presenting this work on behalf of Brian Sivos, who's published the personal draft, which is the lightweight bundle protocol edge node with zero configuration and zero state. Um, and this is to address the use of existing protocols and mechanisms to stand up lightweight single application BP edge nodes. Next slide. So first, some background. Um, currently, you have to supply existing BPA and CLA implementations with external configuration so that you can bootstrap into the BP network. And that configuration is a burden to network admins since it lacks a standard form, has to be maintained, and is redistributed when it changes. And that configuration is also a burden to the users of the edge nodes since it requires translation and synchronization when changes are made again. So that burden translates to a barrier to entry to both potential users and for developers, especially around prototyping and interoperability testing. So the goal of this draft is to significantly lower that barrier to entry for lightweight BP edge nodes, which I'm going to define further on the next slide. So if we look at a simple use case from the draft, I have IP LAN connectivity, and now I wanna get on the BP network. I don't care about the other CLAs that are involved, the routing algorithms, et cetera. I just wanna plug my box in and have it work. That capability exists already in the IP domain, and there are existing mechanisms that we can use to provide that same capability for BP. We don't need new protocols or tools for this simple case. We don't need mechanisms like router to router discovery, since this is purely at the edge of the network. We don't need general case CLA discovery. And the edge node in this case doesn't have to support multiple applications. So we're picking a simplifying use case to solve first because it represents a common need and it lets us make use of the existing work in this space. Next slide. So the draft identifies the existing mechanisms that support this proposed configuration and the new behavior that has to be defined to allow those existing pieces to interact properly on a BP network. So the first half of the document addresses CLA discovery. It builds from service discovery on IP networks using DNS SD. And there are several pieces needed to use DNS SD that we already have, including the TCP IP service parameters, a registered service name, and a certificate profile for authentication and authorization. The need for a new behavior here is at a higher level to allow the router to offer itself and the edge node to enumerate and use that TCP CL service. The second half of the document then covers the zero state BP agent, which supports the use of TCP CL already to send and receive bundles. But if we can simplify its operation um, to say that it supports a single application and CLA, then the BPA no longer has to maintain state and it doesn't need queues. Uh, instead, many of those BPA functions can be handled by a software library or in middleware and allows us to simplify this configuration. Next slide. So 
So it's important to note that the, the intent of this draft is to not solve everyone's problem. Um, this very limiting use case of an edge node supporting a single application is very intentional. Um, if your goal is to operate in an IP network over TCP, we can reduce the burden of configuration and turn this into something like a library to import so that someone can then try operating on a BP network just the same in terms of what it takes to get up and running. So keep in mind that these mechanisms are not for general purpose neighbor discovery for operation anywhere other than at the edge of the BP network or for operation over non IP networks or not over TCP CL. The proposed mechanisms can definitely be changed a bit to relax some of the simplifying assumptions that were made. And this is discussed a bit in the draft already, which now has a second version posted to address the first round of feedback that was received. Next slide. And I believe this is my final slide. So for next steps, the um, any feedback on the document or um, even implementation feedback would be very much appreciated. Uh, potentially, we see this as a good topic for a hackathon, if there's any interest, since it's um, an idea that's building off of existing mechanisms and infrastructure. And if you have any feedback or want to get into the discussion points that are listed here, around proper routing between edge nodes um, and some thoughts on requirements. Um, I will just request that you take that to the mailing list so that Brian can also participate in those discussions. So with that, that's all I've got. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, no one in the queue? Just uh, uh, Rick, personal opinion. I think this is really good work. I think it's um, I think it's really valuable to just chip away at these nice, easy edge cases, get a working solution that builds on existing technology. I think good stuff. Thank you, Brian, as well, because I know it's it's primarily your hard work as well as Sarah's. Great. And I think that's it. Is me. So. That's the end of presentations on drafts in progress. And we wanted to use the latter half of this meeting to, to raise a couple of discussion points and to discuss topics that are sort of pre-draft, but we feel as chairs and also personally through discussion with others as well, that there are uh, some hot topics that probably need to be addressed. And it's helpful to do that with the background of some slides. So Ed's kicking off first, talking about applications and how they live well in a delay tolerant world go on Ed. Uh, hi I, i'm ed and uh, exactly right as as rick mentioned i did want to put together a couple of thoughts on what it means to be delay tolerant and we talk certainly in this working group is the delay tolerant networking working group but if you have applications that have to run over a delay tolerant network the, the network can be delay tolerant you know, as much as it can be. If your applications aren't, that doesn't mean things will suddenly work, right? There are things at the application level that, that have to be accommodated uh, if you're operating in a particular environment. And then I wanted to end with a couple of thoughts on Deep Space as someone that, that works on Deep Space spacecraft and the flight software and the operations therein. But I will also point out that uh, there has been a very active uh, mailing list on Deep Space. Uh, considerations and, and how networking works there. And there are uh, sidebar meetings, uh, one happening today and I think one happening tomorrow. If you are also interested, uh, please go um, find those and, and participate. So the, the first observation, which again is probably not an earth uh, shaking observation, is pretty intuitive observation, is that a tolerant network doesn't help an intolerant application. Uh, and so when we start talking about what does it mean to be delay intolerant, it means all the things we tend to want out of our applications. We want it to be very quick. We want it to not have to have a lot of um, uh, delay back to the user. We want to be able to send our data very, very quickly. And if something doesn't look right, we want to throw everything away and start over again, hoping that by throwing everything away and starting over again, clicking refresh or something else, then we're able to get back to a normal operating condition. And we're willing to try and try and try until the stars align and we can make things go. 
if you need to be delay tolerant, then there are some things that, that probably you should be thinking about at the application layer. And if we need to operate applications in a delayed environment, contested, challenged, and so on, then we should be asking ourselves questions of, are the applications we're trying to run inherently tolerant or inherently intolerant? So uh, again, one of the things that uh, we talk about for intolerance is when applications will determine when they need a response back. And particularly if those needs for response back are things that the application itself will act upon. So if applications use application timers uh, that say, I, I require that I get an acknowledgement back from the other side of my application within a certain period of time, and that period of time is short enough, seconds, minutes, or maybe even hours, then uh, I always run into the issue of what happens if I'm in a highly delayed or highly challenged network. Um, another thing that can make applications intolerant uh, is assuming that there are state synchronization mechanisms. And, and we'll talk about why that's a, a can be a difficult assumption in just a slide or two. But state synchronization means two things. One is that end-to-end -end state can be established. And then once so established, it can be meaningfully kept up to date, uh, even if endpoints are coming and going. Uh, and then the last is the applications do assume that either the uh, duration of sessions or information exchanges are relatively short enough or the amount of state keeping is relatively small enough that it can all fit within the compute resources of a particular node. And you know, if we are on common desktops, as we understand, having thousands and millions of, of session um, you know, sets of information is really not a problem. But if we're in very resource constrained, environmentally powered uh, devices, then we really do start asking ourselves, how much information are we storing and why? So, and, and of course, even, even in very resourced environments, we know that there are things that we do to help already. We, we know that pre-placing data is important and that's why we have content caching and that makes things work. We know that we're trying to go more towards uh, completely push mechanisms and not pulling data uh, because even in our very high availability, high rate networks, we know that it makes things work better. We know that reducing the number of sessions that we have going to things like RESTful interfaces, even if we have sort of a stateful and state synchronized transport, not adding extra uh, state synchronization just because is something that makes things work better. So we already thematically look at how to make our applications a little more quote unquote tolerant, uh, even, even on the internet. So when we get away from the internet, uh, or when we extend the internet into different non-traditional areas, there are two things that I think we have to take a look at. One is the, the tension between latency and intermittency. Uh, oftentimes we'll talk about delay tolerant networks, right? The, the DTN working group. And delay uh, could be interpreted, misinterpreted as the latency due to long signal propagation delays. Uh, however, that, that doesn't necessarily capture what delay really means. Delay could mean uh, not just long signal propagation delays, but also uh, I have lost contact with something that I'm trying to communicate with. If we're a spacecraft because it's on the other side, for example, of the sun, uh, or it turned off or the radio turned off. So if we look at uh, the problem of delay tolerance as solely one of long latencies, well, we can fix that. that that's not particularly difficult to fix because uh, long latencies can be accommodated with longer timers or longer timeouts for timers. And if we just hold on to state and wait uh, and don't time something out, that's fine. However, if we're trying to understand extreme intermittency, uh, which is separate and comes about because I have lost contact with something that I'm trying to communicate with, possibly because it's no longer turned on, it has rebooted uh, or, or, some, or gone into an idle state, then simply extending timers is not a solution to that. So again, the observation here is a latency solution is a not necessarily an intermittency solution. So as we look at what it means to have a tolerant application, we need to understand whether we're tolerating simply latency or whether we're tolerating intermittency. The other uh, one that, that is important to us here uh, to everyone is security. And there's a, the difference, of course, between transport security and communication security. And oftentimes, if we have a single transport end-to-end, -end, they look like they're somewhat similar, but, but they are 
quite different. So uh, transport security is securing um, at the transport layer. And it assumes, uh, as we talk about it, that you know the endpoints of the secure data exchange are using a transport layer, using the same transport layer, because you're applying security at the transport layer. And if you switch transport layers, then, then you've broken that, that chain of security. Uh, and that, so if you're assuming that you have the same one and that you're not switching, that's fine. Communication security is different. That is the secured end-to-end -end information exchange. It's properties and carried with the data itself. And it doesn't necessarily come just from uh, the transport layer, in particular when we talk about bundle protocol and BPSEC and, and the fact that we could operate bundles over different transport layers. We, we come to uh, the situation where a store and forward network may get data coming in over one transport, and then it will store it. And then when it goes to forward it, it will forward it over perhaps a very different transport. Certainly not the same tunnel, certainly not the same session, or perhaps not the same tunnel, and perhaps not the same session, but it could be a completely different transport as well. So we have to separate the concept of securing our data from securing our transport layer. And so again, if we are trying to be tolerant of delays, we have to be tolerant of changes to the transport end to end. So in all of that, a couple of assumptions that can come out, and, and these sort of have a parallel construction, but we should be careful when assuming that systems are very capable and powered. And we should be careful about making that assumption because that is not always the case. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, one environment where it's not always the case, which is deep space networks. But telecommunication systems in general could have very, very short duty cycles. I mean, yes, when we put a NIC in our server, that thing's going to be powered probably all of the time. But if you're a small solar powered device with a radio, that radio will probably be powered off most of the time. And we can see realistically duty cycles for radios down 5, 10, 15 percent. Uh, we have to be careful if we assume that long round trip times only affect timers. Because again, if you have duty cycling, uh, in, in particular duty cycling, then you may be losing state, not just um, latency. We have to be careful about assuming that local processing is always sufficient. If we want to maintain state end to end, that is additional memory, it is additional compute, it is additional um, work to store and restore uh, coming back again from a sleep or an idle state that very embedded and resource constrained systems tend to want to limit. If, you, if anyone has ever done boot uh, or, or, or state uh, restoration of a very resource constrained embedded device, people spend an awful lot of time worrying about that. Uh, and then again, we do have to be careful about that idea of a single secure transport because uh, with particularly long round trip delays, you may get into store and forward situations, you may change topology, topology changes may uh, cause you to change your transport uh, decisions that you make. In all of that, uh, if we come back and say, if we have delay tolerant networks that are bundle based and we want uh, delay tolerant applications, or at least not delay intolerant applications, then when should we consider BP inclusive stacks? And so there are a couple of things to think about as to whether bundles are you know, solutions here. Again, a little repetitive, but when you have uh, intermittency and not latency and when you need to do that store and forward, that is what bundles are built for and the structures of the PDU and the structures of the security therein are meant to carry the annotative information to help with that. Um, if your end-to-end -end is going to be using multiple transports, then bundle is, is meant to exist as an overlay over different transports. And generally, uh, when you are in a very resource-constrained environment, um, bundles actually, uh, the, the amount of software needed to implement and use a bundle uh, and we saw just a, a hint of that uh, in the prior presentation when we were talking about the uh, zero comp um, uh, bundle agent, the, the bundle API and satisfying it can actually be done with a very small amount of code and run very well on very resource constrained devices and carry uh, some, some of these uh, sort of features that we need separate from, from building and implementing multiple stacks, uh, which can bring additional code and compute. The reason why some of this is particularly important right now is we are doing a, an awful lot of uh, thought uh, about space networking, and uh, some of that is, is deep space. I, I myself don't have a fully good grasp of what deep space means. 
I think it means uh, within Lagrange points, <laughs> then um, perhaps up to including cislunar. And I think people are arm wrestling right now over whether cislunar does or does not mean deep space. Uh, but, but there are a couple of uh, things I want to make. And I just have two slides on this. Uh, one is uh, I, I want to talk about what kind of systems we might be building in the next five, maybe even 10 years. Uh, if anyone has ever been, and the reason for that is we're the IETF, right? And we, we do want to understand how to make engineering recommendations based on what might be uh, put into mission proposals right now. If anyone has ever worked on a deep space mission proposal, you know, deep space is expensive. You know, the, some of the least expensive deep space missions I'm aware of are around $100 million, uh, but, but typically that's really, really small. Uh, and they pretty regularly go over a billion dollars. And because of that, you usually propose to a technology baseline. And the technology baseline has to be something that exists uh, at the time that you propose it, not I'm sure we will have figured this out over the next three to five years that it takes to build and launch something. Um, and, and a couple of examples of that, that that I've worked on and I'm familiar with, uh, you know, the, just for scale, if you will, you know, the New Horizons uh, spacecraft was a was a um, cost saving $700 million. It was originally, uh, I think, a one, one, one and a half billion dollar uh, project running, you know, a blazing 12 megahertz mongoose processor, uh, which for those who don't know, was the, the same processor that was run on the original PlayStation, uh, although uh, significantly downclocked, and I think was running about eight megabytes of RAM. Uh, we, we did better on the Parker Solar Probe, which was a $1.3 billion mission, but we had an 80 megahertz Leon 3. Uh, fault tolerant. And I, I, we might have had a little more than 22 megabytes of RAM, but we, we only used 22 megabytes of RAM uh, you know, for the system. And then uh, folks may have heard about the DART mission, which uh, you know, hit the asteroid uh, last year. Very successful mission, particularly because of how inexpensive it was at $330 million uh, to come in. <laughs> Also running an 80 megahertz Leon 3 UT700 with, again, a, a whopping 16 megabytes of RAM. Uh, these, what, what's interesting about that is, of course, is that New Horizons, Parker Solar Probe, uh, DART, uh, the money that's associated with them and the time it takes to build them, these are not small investments. Uh, one would think if you're going to throw a $1.3 billion at a spacecraft, you wouldn't have a compute problem. You're running 80 megahertz Leon 3. Right, the, the money is going into your instruments, safety, um, and just the fact that you have to live in and exist in this environment. So we, we need to understand when we talk about deep space, what that environment looks like and what people are willing to fly there, what they can fly there. So uh, my last slide on this is, again, can, well, and then a, a final get off the stage slide, is <laughs> there's always more. Uh, they, the considerations, please, we have to understand what is the impact on RAM? What is the impact on our CPU? What happens when to save power? Power constraints dominate everything, right? New Horizons uh, was, was uh, nuclear powered. It was a radioisotope thermal generator powered by plutonium. The, the irony that the mission to Pluto was powered by plutonium was lost on no one. But, but we had about 300 watts of power at launch. Uh, not, not even, maybe 280. And by the time 10 years later, we got to Pluto, it was down to 240 or something like that. I mean, for everything, instruments, heaters, computers, everything. So it, if you don't need it, it's off, right? You're not going to just dump power uh, to keep your exciters warm. Uh, you're not going to have your radio on unless you expect to be transmitting or expect to be receiving and you plan those. If you look at a 40 minute round trip time at Mars, you're gonna transmit a data volume and then you're gonna turn your radio off if you don't think you're gonna need it for 40 more minutes to come back and receive something uh, back again. It, and that's part of what we do with like deep space network planning is understanding when will spacecraft turn their radios on so that they can understand it. Uh, we don't see things like we're gonna stay powered all the time just because someone might want to talk to us. Uh, that, that's not something you can do in an environment that is dominated by power constraints. Um, so I have, I have a couple of questions here in that I, we, we, ask, we are asked questions often in the DTN working group about what it means to make tolerant networks. There's a larger question of what kind of applications run on those networks. What does it mean to have an intolerant application or a tolerant application? And what are some of the use cases and environments that drive you one way or another? Uh, so I want to uh, toss out there in the working group and then we can follow up as well on the mailing list, but is there enough material 
here? Are there enough intelligent things to say about this problem and these tensions that we should write an informational document of some kind that says this is what a tolerant application is? And this is what it means to run in an environment like a DTN environment. Or here are some use cases and problems that sort of evidence uh, why you need to think about the tolerance or the intolerance of your application. And then the second is uh, a lot of the DTN work was, was uh, sort of uh, started uh, with that foundational document, RFC 4838, which defined the delay tolerant network architecture and some of the use cases there. And that was published 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Have we learned enough in the past 15 years or so that there is an update to that document that should be made? If we were to look at that, are there things that, that seem less important than they were in that document? Are there things that were missing that needed to be added? Um, are there more important things to add? Or do we feel that that document has held uh, firm over the past 15 years? So uh, that's really all I wanted to talk about was to put a couple of observations together, a little bit of considerations uh, with experience from deep space networking, and then to be able to come back and say, uh, you know, is there is there value in producing these kinds of documents? And then, of course, if there is, who would who would do such a thing? Right. Okay. Oh, we've got Stephen in the queue. Hi, Stephen. I, I don't know. I have, I'd have to reread for you thirty eight. Um, so I have no opinion on that yet. So I did. Can you go back one onto the the, the the kind of yeah. Uh, and actually, another one, but the one with your billions of dollars. Um, I'm not clear what message that's kind of sending to the working group in, term, to, in terms of, like, if people are working on specifications that turn into RFCs, are you basically saying, don't expect this to be implemented and deployed in deep space for another five or 10 years, at least? So so if, if you're, well... I'm, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that's a good or bad thing. I'm just, you know, yeah. I think it might help people to you know, as in terms of how they think about the process, because it's not the normal thing for ITF proposed standards. Well, and, and I think that's important because the barrier to entry is different. Uh, I, I frequently ask lots of people for billions of dollars. Uh, only a small subset of them have a billion dollars uh, to give, and only a smaller subset of them are willing to give it to, you know, to me. But the, the, in all cases, for, for those organizations that have the responsibility to write those kinds of checks, they want a established technical baseline at the time that something is awarded. Sure. Right? So, so if we're writing RFCs and we say it's going to take two or three years to get through the process and it could fundamentally change along the way, that, that's good, except my, my experience would say that missions will come back and say, we're going to baseline something else because it's not if they, ready. If they have to pick during that two or three years, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so that, that's, that's a message. Uh, the other is really thinking through what are the impacts of the things that we are standardizing because the, the cost is high, which means that things get locked in pretty early and the constraints are significant. Sure. And, and those are also things we don't typically work through because if we have, if we're deploying something, we have more compute resources, we can throw a little more memory at something or we can you don't get locked in very early in a five-year development cycle for something that then has to live largely unmodified for the next 50 years or 20 years or something like that. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, so, so I think the basic message is, you know, it, for the RFCs produced by this working group, when you're trying to think about those being applied in, in deep space missions, it's not even going to start until like five years after the RFC is written kind of thing. Because that's when they that's when they would say to say we'll adopt that. It, that, that but for other applications, it might all happen much quicker. Yeah, I completely agreed. And the only right. reason I hesitate on that is there's a lot of private interest in space and deep space, and and that's of course any any private you know companies can do what they wish. Uh, but my experience is that the the agencies that like NASA that build these things they want that established at the beginning. And so if your RFCs aren't going to be done for a few years, it's not going to be in the technical baseline for anything coming around right now. Yeah, as far as I know, I think my experience of ESA is they're, they're the same, basically. So. Yeah, yeah. Eric? Uh, thank you. I wanted to say that I, I think there is uh, value to some of the work, on, especially if you go back to the last slide. Um, particularly if one of the thing, one of the outcomes is uh, we elucidate the requirements for the API between bundle protocol applications. 
and yeah. an agent running. Like, oh, yeah. if you think about the the IP the IP networking, we have taps now, but prior to that, everybody pretty much understood BSD sockets, POSIX, libc calls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know what that is for a bundle protocol application, um, but we should probably. It would be good to have that scoped out to understand. Applications need to get addresses. They need to do this. They need to do that. What are the things they need to do? How do they do it? Um, and and uh, uh, don't have to write a, a C style API or anything like that, but uh, a TAPS style API requirements or something would be a, a useful outcome, I think, to encourage some standardization across uh, uh, app, app writing, maybe. No, I like that a lot. I would love to read that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have no submission API. We, I, I don't know how to send a bundle unless I know exactly which BPA implementation I'm using. Yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff that happens at the control plane sort of magic provisioning layer that's yeah. just magic right now. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ed. Um, so we'll swap. <laughs> so as should become obvious fairly quickly, um, Ed and I talk quite a lot, which is we're supposed to do that sort of thing. And uh, so my slides also kind of dance around the same subjects, but rather than coming from an application layer, it's looking more at um, the recent discussion we had on the list about Quick and the use of IP uh, in deep space. So I thought I'd start with an emoji because I'm far too old and far too British to be using emojis, but I don't care. So next slide, please. Oh, uh, important. This is meant to be gentle slightly tongue-in-cheek, I've included some light quotes and jokes because I don't think this is a subject we should fight about. And that's actually my underlying message. So, as you're all probably aware, there was some really active debate on, on two mailing lists, but let's not get into that, after Mark and uh, his other authors posted the uh, draft many deep space IP assessment document which was well-read and well-reviewed, which is fantastic. And yeah, he asked some very, he and the team asked some very good questions, which is, you know, whether the requirements of communication in deep space could be addressed by a pure IP solution, particularly, you know, by using QUIC, because QUIC is, is good and has some very good features that, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Um, I participated. And I wanted to present my personal opinions. So this is chair hat, definitely off. Next slide, please. So as I understood them, and Mark is at the back of the room so he can correct me where I go wrong, the core points of the argument for using Quick in deep space are, well, IP works. It's, it's proven technology. We've, we've, you know, the internet's pretty good. It seems to work pretty well. Um, IP hardware and software exists, you know, commodity pricing and uh, the, the tech stacks out there. I can find people who know how to write networking software. I can buy networking software. I can buy networking hardware that all runs on IP and it just works. I mean, that's a no brainer. And yeah, I can't remember the name of the RFC, but the, the, the work that went into looking at TCP IP over very long RTTs about 20 odd years ago said, yes, there are problems with time of retransmissions with TCP and there are problems. But, you know, quicks around now. We've learned a lot in the last 20 odd years about dealing with very long latencies and, and keeping sessions um, alive. And, and they made some very valid points that quick can handle these, these long RTTs without much problem. And the whole IP management, you know, Dan pointed out the whole IP management stack, you know, NetConf, ResConf, uh, SNMP, if you want to go back, you know, it, that's there. It exists. It works. We can, we can buy these pieces of kit and we can manage them and we know how to do this. You know, there's a whole, the whole ops field exists. We can do this. So Dan, next slide, please. And there was, uh, there was just one comment in the chat on, on this slide deck, which is the, the last bullet on IP management. Um, there, there is some, that's not necessarily true. There is uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I am making gross generalizations here. I will, I will admit, I'm, I'm, I'm treading softly. I'm just exploring. So next slide, please. All of these points are valid. You know, you're sure there are corner cases where, oh, particularly, you know, you might want to, why do we have to use XML and XML over long distances, blah, 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 blah. But the core points are valid. 
you know, IP works. Quick can probably handle the latency problems. That's fine. That's great. Next slide, please. But, and this goes back to what Ed said, what is deep space? Well, I'm, I'm going to use the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy quote because A, I like Douglas Adams and B, I think it sums it up. It's really big. You know, we're talking beyond Leo Geo stuff here. We're talking out, you know, next the next generations of, of human exploration into deep space. When I talk about it, I talk beyond Cislunar, beyond Lagrange points for, for Earth. We're, we're talking about the big deep space stuff, okay? Next slide, please. Does the size matter? I just, I, it makes for a great title. Um, the size does matter because it introduces physical problems that the internet doesn't have. And, and this is where I'm starting to repeat something some of the topics that Ed covered, and so I, I won't go too deep into it. Delay is one aspect, sure. When we start measuring things in AU, you know it's got big. Um, when the speed of light starts to matter significantly in your round-trip time calculations, you know things have got big. Um, also, things move. You know, <laughs> There's orbital mechanics, but things are moving, which means that link from A to B is going to change over time. And so, you know, you're not laying down a really nice fixed topology with fiber optic cables anymore. It's, it's things are moving around. And I think the, the, the second part is actually disruption. And this goes back to what Ed was saying as well. Planetary bodies are really good occluders. <laughs> if you're using radio systems or, or optical systems, they, they get in the way. They're a pain like that. Pointing beams over long distances gets really hard. You know, you work it out with a pencil, it's, it becomes quite obvious how hard it gets. And this is what Ed put in his slides much better, than, and I've summarized in one line. Operating technology in deep space is actually all about power. And assuming that your device is on at all times is, is a false assumption. And sure, we'll get smarter with power, we'll crack fusion in another 30 years, I'm sure. But we're still, there will be another fuzzy edge where we'll be pushing those boundaries where delay and disruption and power dominate what's happening. And I think, you know, as, as we expand out, that fuzzy edge will always be there. Next slide, please. So... DTNs. So the current approach to communication in deep space is to build store and forward networks that can survive that delay and disruption, which we find in deep space. You know, when with all of those points that, that both of us have now brought up, relying on an end-to-end -end communication link stops being a, a viable way forwards and saying, okay, let's store forwards hop by hop. It's, it's a little bit of a no-brainer, but I wanted to reiterate some of these points. And the approach within the IETF working group is to standardize what I am paraphrasing as an information-centric store and forward overlay network built around the, the bundle protocol is the, is the implementation detail of that. Um, and I am a rude observer at times, and I often describe DTN actually as email done right. You know, <laughs> mail travels, you know, hopefully it will fix the spam and binary and blah, blah, blah. Next slide, please. Because I just want to unpack information-centric, store and forward, and overlay network. And why I use those terms. Information-centric is because the basic unit of communication in a DTN that we discuss is an infogram. It is a self-contained, self-describing package of information as compared to a 1500-octet datagram or a stream of bytes. Datagrams and bytes, uh, um, I can't remember the name of the, the model which has uh, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Uh, it's it's a, quite an old-fashioned psychological uh, th or business thing. IP networks move bytes. Bundle protocol moves messages. A message is in, has informational value of its own, and it is self-contained. If you get the message, you can do something with it. If you get some bytes out of IP, you probably need some context in order to work out what that is, unless you can fit the whole thing into a 1500 MTU or, or whatever. Point two, store and forward. It's explicitly understood that you will not have an end-to-end -end path a lot of the time, and therefore you should not expect an end-to-end -end path. So assumptions about how addresses are resolved needs to be hop by hop. You need to understand that your security 
needs to work at rest as well as in transport. And, and Ed covered this with the difference between transec and comsec. Very important. The fact that you may... Scott was talking about some of the custody transfer problems. You may have effectively bundles going backwards up the transmission path in order to find a viable way forwards. Changing transport layers, key expiry and things like that. These are complex topics. And I think the most important part of what we're building is an overlay network. I mean, we don't often address this, but bundle protocol rides on top of other transport protocols. It's a bit weird being in transport when we're an overlay. But what we don't actually solve is, you know, in traditional OC model, the, the layer two. We don't give a damn about the layer two. The layer two is actually layer three in, in IETF terms. We ride on top of this stuff. So, yes, we might have convergence layers and define convergence layers, but we have the TCP convergence layer, which rides on top of IP. We have UDP, LTP, again, is a, is a way of, of moving, fragment, getting a bundle from one hop to the next logical hop, whatever, in the overlay. But what happens underneath is pretty transparent to bundle protocol, and it doesn't actually care. Next slide, please. Okay, so BP does not equal IP. That's starting to, to, to take off as a catchphrase. I can't remember, I think it was Jorge who started it first, but it, yeah, I, I like it. So I'm asserting that. I assert that it makes no sense to compare directly IP with BP because they are serving different purposes because they address different use cases. However, and I've, I kind of mentioned this before, IP is already part of the BP stack. You know, the only standards track convergence layer we have is built on TCP. And we know TCP doesn't work in deep space, but it doesn't mean it's not a viable convergence layer to have in your toolbox when you want to build BP networks, which is why we standardized it. There are other things which may work better for particular environments, but going back, because bundles run across the bundle protocol overlay network, that choice of link routing, uh, the, uh, hop by hop transmission protocol can be made hop by hop or by implementers or with a sufficient flexibility. So, and what's, what's important there is that but what bundle protocol considers one hop may be many, many hops in the underlying network. So you could consider a, a bundle that comes from some deep space probe, hits some ground station and is then delivered to a researcher's PC. That from ground station to researcher's PC may be one logical bundle hop but it may transit half the internet to get there. So there's a, it's overlays. I'm, I'm assuming you know about overlays. I, I'm happy to take that question from Jensen. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very quick question just no, to clarify no. something for me. I'm new to this group, so. Uh, that's why I kind of no, wanted no, to re go it, over but I'm not this new to the problem. Forget. I'm not new to the problem, so my, yeah, I should not talk about this now. Um, my question is, when you say it's, do you only have an implementation on TCP, there's no relation to CCS, DS protocols right now at all? Or is uh, this... Let me clarify, sorry. Okay. We, the IETF has only standardized as a, uh, a standards track document. Okay. That, that the answers TCP everything. CL, <laughs> Thank you. A little bit of uh, d detail. Yes, there are lots. CCS, DS is now um, continuing the standardization of LTP because it's very deep space. There's personal drafts on UDP. Eric, to your left, has a early draft on an Ethernet. Uh, there's All lots, good. and that's that's Thank part you. of the model, but we may not. We're a little behind on the standardization, but please uh, start typing. <laughs> Next slide, please. So a little bit of rapprochement. And, and for those who don't speak French, I'll let you, Wiki, Wikipedia has a good example of it. Quick has some fantastic properties that would make it an ideal convergence layer. And when we mean convergence layer, the technology that makes the hop to hop stuff work. You know, the Deep Space IP draft explains how you can run IP in many non-terrestrial use cases, very successfully. IP networks already exist on the planet, obviously, I'm using one, but Leo and Geo, they're, they're already running IP, and more and more of it will happen. 
Um, I can see IP networks being native on the moon in the next 10 years. Correct me, those who know more about this than I do, but my predictions, and I can imagine Mars having a native IP network at some point. And that doesn't mean bundle protocol is pointless, but it also means, oh my God, there's some transit networks we can use when we're trying to move things around on a planet before we try and get it off a planet or get it back to a planet from somewhere else where elsewhere so so quick would be fantastic to let us move bundles around and a quick convergence layer is, is appears to be a no-brainer uh, tcpcl describes how to frame things and a, and a stream orientated reliable transport quick has very much the same it's multi-streaming with a head of line blocking which is fantastic built for for http so what we do for TCPCL is entirely transferable across to Quick. We just have to work out which streams and how to do the multiplexing and demultiplexing, but it doesn't seem hugely complex. And then suddenly we can build on all the great stuff that's in that deep space IP draft and say, great, throw Quick and IP out as far as it'll go. It works. And then we can piggyback bundles onto the back of that. And then bundles can do the bit which where IP starts to, uh, to show some fuzzy edges because of going back to Ed's presentation, that disruption, that delay, that distance, which really starts to kick in. In combination, these things make a lot of sense to me. Last, next slide, please, is my last, I think. So this is my suggestions of what we should probably do in this case. I think it would be really good to continue the, the, the work trying to make quick and IP work in, let's call it near space, whatever that means. Let's find out the limits. Let's, let's go find out the limits. Let's find out how far this stuff will go because it, it's good tech. Let's standardize a BP convergence layer on quick. It shouldn't be too hard, but I haven't started typing it. But <laughs> famous last words. Um, and then let's roll it all out. Let's roll out IP and quick and bundle protocol as well, everywhere we can, as soon as possible, and get it all running because otherwise people will keep reinventing in isolation, in silos. And the internet has proven that despite all the flaws in IP, having a consistent protocol to allow the transmission of traffic around on, on this planet has made a great deal of sense. If we can push that out as far as possible, it's probably good for humanity. And can we have one mailing list, please? Because I'm bored of following two of them and cross-posting. And because we're talking about space, I had to put live long and prosper because it's about trying to get a bit of humanity in here as well. So um, yes, I will take questions. That's my last slide, I hope, or I'll just duck and cover. Done, good. <laughs> oh, we do have Oh, here we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just try to figure out how to use the unfine tool. This question here. Uh, Tianji, uh, CMCC. Uh, here you talk about like the deep space or kind of uh, the, the very big uh, uh, big picture here. Actually, you know, without the, I, I try to get some information about like a computer, like a satellite, uh, satellite constellation part. It's also fit into the DTN things. Cause uh, you know, on the on, on other side of the SVO, they're called a 3GPP working on some satellite based, mm -hmm. based communication. There are some uh, release 19 work to give like the start forwarding. So basically the thing you're talking about here. And also uh, I think it satisfied the first point you mentioned like information transfer. Mm -hmm. The second is start forwarding. The last part, uh, something like, uh, I think you mentioned the three points. Uh, the last part is like a decent or latency or intermittent something. Yeah, uh, yeah. probably intermittency. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. basically like your three things. So yeah. all the three things actually are on the, that, the, the store forwarding satellite are fitting into this part. And then, you know, I, I come here, try to get the, you know, some, some insight or help about here, cost in the uh, 3GPP side for this type of store forwarding uh, service. Cause uh, uh, they are trying to say, okay, for some very, some application or services like uh, MBLT or short message that itself uh, uh, is a delay tolerant application. Cause the, that will make the life easier at this moment. Mm -hmm. So there are some architecture assumption there say, okay, for the SL in the static link, that is something out of the picture right now from the 3GPP side. 
but the here actually I come here want to say okay for the actually I think for the six G or next things mm -hmm. this will uh, play into the picture not for just the NB IoT or like a short message those type of mm -hmm. delay tolerant application but for delay intolerant application will need to use this DTN network to do the work. So when I look at the things and then listen to the, the, all the, all the session here, I have not found that part uh, from you know, the working group. That is the thing. Go on, Ed. Well, you, you look like you've got an answer to that. Well, never an answer, but a comment. Uh, so the uh, particular for when we talk about 3G uh, and 3GPP, 3GPP uh, there was some work that was done a few years ago uh, to look at what it would uh, take to build delay tolerant applications in, I think at the time, a, a 4G LTE uh, scenario. And, and I don't know if that work sort of would help with this understanding. Uh, now the things like the, the, the enobia or genome, the base station will be onboard satellite. Sure, so sure. that will be different from the one you mentioned about that things. Mm -hmm. Remember, the, it's like uh, the, when the onboard satellite, the base station, you are going to have the ISL link and also the, uh, the, the fader link will be delay, intermittent, all kinds of things you're talking about here. Yeah. The, there was, uh, the work that was done was um, something around uh, something called a, 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 de a deferred bearer uh, or a delayed bearer. And, and so it, it was the idea that local applications could send their data to a, a caching proxy bearer, which would then be uh, attached to a dedicated bearer that would be established later. Uh, and then the, the caching proxy would allow data to flow without the application understanding that it delivered data to a bearer that was just holding on to it locally, waiting for it to be transmitted later. And that was a way of hiding the store and forward uh, in, in a bearer, a store and forward bearer so that the applications don't need to know about it. And that was implemented and tested on the International Space Station um, to, to show that it would do the work with, between the ISS and ground stations. Okay, oh, but uh, since that is not on the, the, the 5G spec itself, because yeah. they're using something different here, because the store forwarding itself, the store will be on the, you know, someplace, not based on the barrier you mentioned. Because the battery there is just used as the way to transmit, not the way to store. There's no specific like a barrier for that sort of authority. There's only just a general the DRB or SRB. So, 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 so I have a, I have a general comment, particularly about Leo. Um, I think Leo is an interesting use case because it's not on the surface of the planet, but it's really close. I mean, it's it's really close. So some of the assumptions built into a general purpose um, DTN using big fat bundles, which is what we're talking about, probably don't apply to Leo, and that's fine. It may be the case that the store, and I don't know a great deal about the 3GPP work that's going on at the moment, but it, when people talk about store and forward, sometimes what they're talking about is big buffers and delay, and some so that they're still trying to maintain that IP uh, I've got UDP datagrams, or I've got basic datagrams, or I've got a stream of things with some selective acknowledgement or, or whatever. And if I've got some intermittency, I can just put a big buffer in there and try and solve the buffer bloat problem, but that's that's there, there's to do. What we're trying to do with this working group is to say, that's fine in Leo, but there are other environments and other use cases where it doesn't work. So can we do two things? Can we provide a solution which will work elsewhere? And can we play well with whatever they want to build in or standardize in Leo? And I think we can, because if they've got an IP layer or something that will carry bundles, that's great. You know, um, <laughs> Somewhere with you, within your uh, eNode B, you could have a bundle service that says, well, I'm doing all this, this um, store and forward at whatever layer they want to do it at. But if I've got a bundle, I can use that and I can move the bundles on and then suddenly bundles can, can transit through, through Leo networks. So. Agree. That's it from, oh. Uh, one more. Oh. And, and Steve and Joe. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not asking the impolite question. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little confused. So there's been a whole bunch of discussion about uh, some of the, the proposals Marcus did. Yep. I totally agree that you know, exploring that 
to me makes total sense. Yeah. Whether it's one list or two lists, I don't particularly care. Two is confusing. Um, but were you proposing that 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 kind of exploration be part of the working group's work? Or no, not? sorry, sorry. I the chair hat definitely off. Yeah. Not talking about process or where this should happen. Okay. Just in, in my personal opinion, I don't want to turn around to um, Mark and the guys who are looking at how to make quick and IP work with long latency and, and big RTTs. Keep going. That's okay, great so stuff. I'm, what I'm trying to do, I suppose, with the whole point of this, I'm trying to decouple the how dare you write something that says bundle protocol is irrelevant or, you know, that, that slightly naive knee-jerk reaction I read between the lines on the list where it, it's actually we're trying to address two different problems and they are there's a lot of overlap and they are compatible with each other and they're actually trying to achieve different things so I'm kind of saying okay so everybody some, calm down should, I think we're yeah, fine here yeah. I, mean, I, I can is fine uh, so, so, so you're, what you're assuming then is that the first bullet would not be in the charter of the working group so, which I think, no, no, that could... that is not the first bullet. Is I'm pointing to it for those remote. The the first bullet is out of scope for the current charter of this working group. Exactly. So the so that... second bullet is in scope for this working group. That's clear. But, but I think then in that case, the first and last bullets do could create a kind of a, a bit of a funny situation, right? Um. Yeah, I, I that, that have one mailing list was a frustration because we were having yeah, yeah, the yeah, same can, subject in yeah. duplicate. Hey, this so, might be a plea to the IESG, and I uh, to say, well, we, yeah. does this go back to Quick, or do, if Quick says yeah. there's too many of us in Quick already, do does it spin something else out? But it would keep keep doing. So keep one or two mailing lists is fine, but I think you know if you have one mailing list and some things that are in charter and some not, that's going to be tricky. Yeah. However, so I think the other thing is um, some of the kind of tension here seems to be assuming that you know we're going to end up with an hourglass and there'll only be one waste. Yes. And. It, you know, it's either going to be the bundle protocol or quick and can't do any mixture. I think that's kind of not correct. Um, and then it's also, I think, not correct that <clears throat> there's any one kind of measurable thing that tells you when it's right to use the bundle protocol. Yeah. I mean, you could talk about bandwidth delay products and disruptions. And in fact, what might make the, dis the difference is whether applications exist that run in that stack. And maybe if you're running those applications over quick, it'll run like crap. But it'll work. Yep. And you can't currently run those applications over the bundle protocol for whatever reason. In uh, that case, you're probably going to choose quick, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, right up until the point where you go, this is now so crap. Yeah. We've got to do something else. And and at that point. But I don't think you can. Yeah. So my point is only this that I don't think you can characterize the crappiness by any kind of metric. Oh yeah. There's all sorts of other stuff yeah. goes on in a lot of stuff. So yeah, I, I hope the uh, I hope the first bullet ends up being true. Hmm. I don't care if it's one mailing list or not. Um, and I agree that there shouldn't be this either or kind of tension. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry, perhaps I should have, uh, I, in retrospect, that last bullet should be have some organization about the mailing list and where this discussion happens because tracking two conversations and two lists is just a pain. Anyway. One more. Oh, there's more. Mark, go on. First off, thank you, Mark. Um, Mark Blasher, I just want to. Uh, well, not to say correct, but make sure that um, what we've been working on is is not only quick. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you know, quick is an important piece of it, but we're looking at the whole stack, right? And it's only when the whole stack, you know, all the pieces of the whole stack actually works that you know the whole thing works. So. Um, it's fine that you say so quick, it was short, shorthand. But shorthand. I've heard many times, yeah. you know, quick. You know, it, it's not only quick, so it's actually a larger um, endeavor, if you want. Uh, no, which would be fantastic. And as far out as you can push that, going back to the to the, my first slide, is IP works. We've got the kits. The price points are really competitive. If we can keep, if we can make it work as a further bubble than the surface of the earth, great. Because bundle protocol can still ride on top of it, so there's no fight. Go ahead, sir. So, Jai there, uh, you're really nice, Eddie. So to say. Um, so, I, I, I mean, uh, th this is fine. I mean, you, we are understanding ourselves. Like, yeah, there's like a different kind of sort of work. Um, and it is related, not really the same thing. That's important, and that's where the related part is where I was trying to 
make sure that the DPA space and DTN experts the talk. And, and I agree, like having uh, um, following two mailing lists is a tough thing. So obviously now that you guys are like this, this whole things are like, con this conversation happened. I don't really care which mailing list you more like proponents or whoever picks to take, take one. We have mailing list. So that's not a no brainer to me. So, so I have the deep space kind of discussions and deep space mailing list and DTN to do the DTN things is fine. Now and then cross posting to mm -hmm. announcement and all these things. This is easier, use our common sense basically. Um, and I'm happy to see like we have kind of an understanding, like as I said, like related part, um, but it's a separate thing as you're saying, like this is trying to achieve different things. Uh, whenever I say quick, this is good. Um, I would likely, likely to, as a responsible lady for quick working group as well, I would like quick to be more general purpose than a web thing. So please do experiments. And as I'm saying, do experiments. So when I would like to know, like if these things more an experimental or this is more like an, a ready to standard. I think I have a chat with Mark before. So I think in this space, they will be talking about it. So this is good. So I, I think we're in a good shape. Yeah, I do as well. I really hope we are. So yeah, thanks okay. guys. Good. I'm well over time. <laughs> but we still have time. So we left this bit of the agenda for further discussion because we didn't know how long those previous, how contentious those previous two presentations were going to be or if anyone else wanted to jump to the mic to cover anything else. So, uh, yeah, open mic. Join the queue or... Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, oh, anyway, this is better. I'll introduce, I'll introduce myself a bit better. Um, my name is Jens Finkhäuser. Um, the reason I'm here is sort of several different reasons. One is that uh, I come from a more internet protocol background. My wife and most of her friends are from the space industry, so this overlap interests me immensely. Um, and I'm also, for my work, doing effectively, what, what did you call it, an information-centric uh, um, store and forward uh, Hopefully in the work. So there's, there's a lot of shared interest there. Um, one of the things I've been working on, and I've been shopping around for a working group, and I sent a mail to dispatch, I think this morning or last night, it's a bit of a blur, is actually a, a container format that gives you communications encryption, that gives you some sort of multiplexing of data, that lets you chunk it up, that lets you reassemble it. And I was wondering whether this group is sort of the right place to talk about this. Um, uh, we have one. You have one? Yes. Nice. Have a look at RFC 9171, which describes the bundle protocol um, format, which is Seabor okay. extensible okay. and, and uh, with an associated security. So, um, okay. I, I have no problem looking at this. I have no problem making comparisons. Mm -hmm. If I find that there are things that you're not doing that I'm doing and vice versa, is it still a place yeah, to bring them. mention it? Yes, okay, absolutely. You. That's all. Thank yeah, you. No, no, we're very open to contribution on, on making this better, faster, smarter. Okay. All right. Uh, last call for comments. Last call for calls. Last call for last calls. <laughs> Well, uh, we are adjourned two minutes early. Uh, oh. Thank you so much. We will see you in 119. <laughs> or in a minute. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Hey, how are you? Hi. <laughs> No, 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 no. So,